Welcome back to Catalyst University. My name is Kevin Tokoff. Please make sure to like this video and subscribe to my channel for future videos and notifications. And a big thank you to my patrons on Patreon for your contributions to my channel. In this video, we're going to talk about Huntington's disease. We'll start off by briefly discussing its pathophysiology, and then we'll move into its signs and symptoms, and then we'll talk specifically about how it affects the basal nuclei, which will explain why it leads to the effects that it does. Now, Huntington's disease is caused by abnormalities of a protein aptly named Huntington. Now, over here, this is actually normal, healthy Huntington. Uh, but let's actually look at this protein in a little bit more detail. So here's the primary structure of the protein Huntington. Each one of these circles represents an amino acid. And each amino acid is, of course, encoded by a sequence of three DNA nucleotides in the gene. Now, if we look at the protein structure right here, in the middle, you have these brown circles. These ones are all glutamine, and each glutamine residue is encoded by the nucleotide sequence CAG. And so in the DNA sequence, you have CAG, 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 and so on and so forth. And there's a bunch of what we call these triplet repeats of CAG. Now, a healthy Huntington protein will have anywhere between 10 and 26 repeats of CAG. And that would mean that there would be between 10 and 26 glutamine residues in the middle of the protein in a row. But unfortunately, due to genetic variation and other processes that happen on the genetic level, some individuals may have more than 26 of these CAG repeats. And so you have this table down here, and it gives you basically the number of repeats of that sequence. So if it's 26 or less, uh, we would call that normal, and the person would be unaffected at all by Huntington's disease. Now, if we have a repeat count between 27 and 35 of those CAGs, the classification is intermediate, but the person still would be unaffected. Now, if the person has between 36 and 40 of these CAG repeats, the classification is termed reduced penetrance, and it's variable as to whether or not the person will be affected by Huntington's disease at some point. And if the person has more than 40, it's termed full penetrance, and the person will almost always be affected by Huntington's disease at some point in their life. And really, this should say between 40 and 60 to be full penetrance, because technically, if you have more than 60 of these repeats, it will actually change the time of onset of Huntington's disease, and it'll actually appear much earlier in life. And so if there's more than 60 of them, this would actually be juvenile Huntington's disease. Now, how does having more of these triplet repeats increase your risk of developing Huntington's disease? Well, remember I showed you this normal structure of Huntington right here? Well, when you have a lot of those repeats, it makes it more likely that the protein will misfold. And so we call that mutant Huntington. You can see that the three-dimensional structure here looks very different than it does over here. And so having this particular three-dimensional structure makes it more likely that these proteins will actually stick together or aggregate. And if enough of them aggregate, that will actually kill the cell, which in most cases is a neuron, as it would be in Huntington's disease. So over here on the left down here, you actually see a normal cell with normal Huntington. You can see two of these proteins right here. There are these over here on the left. And they don't come together. They don't misfold. They don't stick together, right? Over here, we have one cell that has mutant Huntington. Here's one of them. But as soon as we get more of those Huntington proteins, you can see that they're misfolded, they tend to stick together, and this is called aggregation. This is what we call prion formation, when they start to aggregate. And eventually, uh, this aggregate becomes large enough that it causes oxidative stress, and it will eventually kill the cell. And that's how you get these neurons degenerating in Huntington's disease. So more specifically, in Huntington's disease, this is a progressive destruction of what we call medium spiny neurons, we'll explore that more at the end of the video, in a portion of the basal nuclei called the striatum. And the striatum is composed of the caudate nucleus and the putamen. Now eventually, other neural regions in the brain will accumulate damage, but initially, it's really just the striatum. And these cells start to die because they're accumulating this Huntington prion protein that's misfolded, and it induces cytotoxicity and cell death. Okay. So what are the signs and symptoms of Huntington's disease? Well, initially, those signs and symptoms may be less motor and actually more cognitive and psychological. For example, difficulty concentrating and lapses in memory. Depression, 
and mood swings such as irritability and aggressive behavior. And there can also be stumbling and clumsiness, and we might term this dyspraxia. But once we start getting more destruction of these neurons in the striatum, then we start seeing these symptoms that are more characteristic of what we would typically think of as Huntington's disease. So the first one is the chorea. This is involuntary jerking or writhing movements. I'm going to show you a couple videos of this. So you can see here that the movements are obviously involuntary. They're jerking, they're writhing, and in some cases people often think of it as looking sort of dance-like, which is actually where the term chorea comes from. Uh, this type of involuntary movement is very different than other types of involuntary movement. This is what you would see in someone with Huntington's disease. Here's our brief review of the direct and indirect pathways for the basal nuclei. Remember that the direct pathway, which is shown here, is responsible for promoting muscle contraction and promoting movement, whereas the indirect pathway is for inhibiting muscle contraction and inhibiting movement. Now, in order to promote movement and muscle contraction, specific nuclei of the thalamus have to be activated. So the more activity we have of the thalamus, the more muscle contraction we're going to have and the more movement associated with a particular region. Then down here we have a couple clusters of cell bodies. Right here we have the globus pallidus internus and then a region of the substantia nigra called pars reticulata. When you see these regions that are in gray boxes, that denotes that they are inhibitory. So when activated, the globus pallidus internus will act to inhibit the thalamus. And so when there's more activity of the globus pallidus internus, there's less activity of the thalamus and less movement. Or the opposite's also true. If we have less activity of the globus pallidus internus, then it's not able to inhibit the thalamus, and so we have more activity of the thalamus and more movement. Now up here we have the striatum, which is composed of the caudate nucleus and the putamen. This is also inhibitory, and this region of the striatum will actually act to inhibit the globus pallidus internus and, of course, the substantia nigra PR. And so if the striatum is inhibiting the globus pallidus internus, then this structure is no longer able to inhibit the thalamus. And so you have two inhibitions in a row, that's called disinhibition, and so the thalamus will have net activation and you'll have more movement. Okay? So the direct pathway is going to result in increased muscle contraction and increased movement. The indirect pathway has the opposite effect. So the striatum is still inhibitory here, and the globus pallidus internus is still inhibitory on the thalamus. However, in this case, a portion of the striatum is sending inhibitory neurons to the globus pallidus externus. Now, normally the globus pallidus externus is inhibitory, and when it's active, it will act to inhibit the subthalamic nucleus. And so in this case, the striatum is inhibiting the globus pallidus externus, and so the globus pallidus externus is no longer able to inhibit the subthalamic nucleus. Okay? So we're inhibiting inhibition, leading to net activation of the subthalamic nucleus. So this is activated, and its job is to then activate the globus pallidus internus. Well, remember how we said when there's less activity of this, there's more movement? Well, now we're activating the globus pallidus internus, and so when there's more activity here, there's actually less movement because the globus pallidus internus will be inhibiting these nuclei of the thalamus, and that leads to less movement, less muscle contraction, and so on and so forth. So direct pathway is more movement, more muscle contraction. Indirect pathway is inhibiting movement, inhibiting muscle contraction. Now let's take a look and see how Huntington's disease affects the basal nuclei. Again, both pathways are shown here, but you'll notice that Huntington's disease has really no effect initially on the direct pathway. The direct pathway is actually left intact. And remember, the direct pathway is responsible for promoting muscle contraction and therefore movement. The striatum is what's affected here, and it's not the entire striatum. So the portion of the striatum that sends neurons to the globus pallidus internus is relatively unaffected, and that's the direct pathway. But when we look at the portion of the striatum that sends neurons to the globus pallidus externus, these are a different type of neuron than we see over here. These neurons on this side are called medium spiny neurons, and when Huntington is mutant and we get the misfolded proteins and they accumulate, thus the prion disease, uh, 
this is actually going to affect the medium spiny neurons more strongly. And so the neurons that are sending output to the globus pallidus externus, those are really what are dying. Okay? Now remember, the striatum's job is normally to inhibit the globus pallidus externus. Well, if these neurons coming from this portion of the striatum are dying in Huntington's disease, are they going to be effective at inhibiting the globus pallidus externus? No. They're not, and so we're going to see increased activity of the globus pallidus externus. Now, what was the job normally of the globus pallidus externus when activated? Well, it's inhibitory, if you can see this gray box here, and so it would inhibit the subthalamic nucleus. Well, now the globus pallidus externus is too active, and so it's producing too much inhibition on the subthalamic nucleus, and so we see a drop in activity of the subthalamic nucleus. Now, what would be the job of the subthalamic nucleus if it were appropriately active? Well, if activated, it should normally activate the globus pallidus internus and substantia nigra PR. But unfortunately, in the case of Huntington's, the subthalamic nucleus is hypoactive. It's not active enough. And so it can't activate the globus pallidus internus, and so we see diminished activity here. Well, normally, what should the job of the globus pallidus internus be in the indirect pathway? It should inhibit the thalamus. But if we can't activate the globus pallidus internus, then we're not going to be able to inhibit the thalamus. And so compared to the normal situation, if we look at the thickness of this line right here, we're going to have too much activity of the thalamus, and therefore too much muscle contraction, and too much movement. And so this is actually what leads to the chorea that we saw a few minutes ago that's characteristic of Huntington's disease. And just to do a brief review of some of those signs and symptoms, yes, we have the chorea. We also end up with muscle problems such as rigidity because there's too much muscle contraction and also muscle contractures. And then we have impaired gait, posture, and balance. These things are going to be secondary to the chorea, and you can probably tell even from a sitting position, the chorea is going to make these things extremely difficult because of the erratic movements, and then also difficulty with speech and swallowing. So hopefully this video gave you a good understanding of how Huntington's disease affects the basal nuclei, where it affects it, and why it leads to the effects that it does. Thanks for tuning in. Please like, subscribe, and check out my Instagram for cool science and not science stuff.